Welcome to you all to the online debate organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance on the topic Monetary Policy in the Euro Area Economic Outlook. The event is held within the initiative Bank Board Academy, but clearly the topic and the implication of today's debate are way more general than just for bank boards. My name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University, and I'm also the founding director of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. I'm delighted to chat the debate today, and I would like to start by welcoming our speakers. We have Fabio Padetta, who is a member of the executive board of the ECB, where he is responsible for international and European relations, market infrastructure and payments, and the bank notes. And then we have Jean Pisani Ferry, who is the Tommaso Padoschio Pacea at the European University Institute. But also he's a professor of economic at Science Po, and more generally, I would say he is a very renowned economist. He also leads the CPR research and policy network on the European economic architecture. Thank you to both of you for being here today, and thank you in particular to Fabio for suggesting to have this discussion. Maybe it was um, suggested in a different context, geopolitical-wise, but nevertheless, we will try to make it as uh, appropriate as possible. The structure of the event will be as follows. Fabio will, key, uh, will give an initial speech for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will have Jean that we will, that will operate as discussant, and then we will open the floor uh, for debate. As usual, our objective in our event is to have them as interactive as possible. So I invite all the participants also to write their uh, question in the Q&A uh, box that you find at the bottom bar of the screen. Before giving the word to Fabio, just a word of consciousness. As I said, the event was organized before this conflict uh, Russian Ukraine started. So you will see the focus of the speech Fabio will give will be mostly on the recovery from the pandemic and the monetary policy in that context. Of course, we will also discuss the more recent event, but let's try to keep the focus on monetary policy without diverging too much in other areas. And with that, let me give the floor to Fabio, thanking him again for being here today. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, dear Elena, dear all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at, uh, at today's seminar. Let me also already now uh, thank Jean. I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion and to exchange the exchange we will have with uh, the audience. But before I start my seminar, let me uh, say that the atmosphere, as Elena mentioned, in which we will have this seminar is, of course, different from what we had imagined and from what we would like uh, to see. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a vicious aggression of a sovereign country and of people that were living in peace. It will imply enormous sufferance for the Ukrainian people who in this very moment are fighting to defend their freedom, their families, their country. The international community should not leave them alone. And uh, let me add that those who claim that wars are justified by history, by differences among human races, or even by religion, are liars in search of personal interest. In general, money, often power, or any other, uh, God knows which personal advantages, but there is no justification for war. Let me now start uh, my seminar. After many years of too low inflation in the Euro area, fears have turned to the prospect that inflation may remain too high for too long. Across advanced economies, the current inflation spike is proving to be broader and more persistent than initially expected leading central banks to reassess the risk that it could become entrenched. There is, this is no easy task, especially in the euro area. The current inflation spike is, for uh, the most part, not being driven by domestic factors. Demand remains below its pre-crisis pre trend. Instead, the economy is experiencing a series of imported supply shocks that are pushing up inflation and depressing demand. This makes medium-term developments extremely hard to anticipate. There are forces at play that could delay the recovery and contain underlying price pressures, and others that could lead to accelerating inflation. 
policy mistakes in either direction could push the economy onto a unfavorable path. Faced with such uncertainty, there is a case for the central bank to accompany the recovery with a light touch, taking moderate and careful steps in adjusting policy so as not to suffocate the as yet incomplete recovery. In the spirit of William Brainerd, we should take small steps in a dark room. The dramatic conflict in Ukraine is now making uncertainty more acute and exacerbating risks to the medium-term inflation outlook on both sides. In this environment, it would be unwise to pre-commit on future policy steps until the fallout from the current crisis becomes clearer. And the ECB stands ready to act to avoid any dislocation in financial markets that could stem from the war in Ukraine and to protect the transmission of monetary policy. The recent inflation data in the euro area do not make for easy reading. Headline inflation reached 5% in January and is expected to stay above 2% for the entire year. I was hoping that a chart would now appear. It will come. Core inflation is at 2.3%. Inflation pressures are becoming widespread, as you might have seen, could have seen, uh, on chart number one. Uh, to determine how monetary policy should respond, we need to understand the drivers of this inflation spike. I have previously spoken about good, bad, and ugly inflation. In short, good inflation is driven by domestic demand and wages consistent with our target, which monetary policy should seek to nurture until the target is reached. Bad inflation instead reflects negative supply shocks that raise prices and depress economic activity, which monetary policy should look through. Ugly inflation is driven by the anchoring of inflation expectations which monetary policy should immediately stamp out. Data indicate that bad inflation is still dominating in the Euro area today. Unlike the United States, our economy is not experiencing excess domestic demand. Household nominal income has not recovered its pre-pandemic trend and households are saving more of their income than they did before the pandemic as shown in chart two, which you now see, and thank you to my collaborators. Consumer spending and investment both remain well below their pre-crisis trends, as is visible from chart number three, as it would have been visible from chart number three. Leon, can you? Okay, this is chart number three. Inflation is largely imported, reflecting global shocks that are spilling over to our economy through import prices, as you can see on the left panel of chart number four. Okay. Around 60% of inflation in January was energy, of which the euro area is a net importer. This is the consequence of the recent extraordinary increase in oil and gas prices, which in turn mainly reflect shocks that compress energy supply, rather than stronger aggregate demand, as is apparent on chart five. The rising cost of, in the cost of energy has further accelerated after the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Inflation is also being fueled by global shift in consumer spending from services to manufactured goods at a time when the pandemic has disrupted production. This has translated into global supply chain bottlenecks, high durable good prices, goods prices, and strong pipeline pressures. This is now being reabsorbed, but at a different pace in different economies, as is visible from chart number six. These glo global supply-driven increases in prices, which also affect food, explain a good part of the currently high headline inflation, as you can see on the left panel of chart 7. In contrast, 
Services inflation has so far largely come from high contact sectors, as reflected on the right uh, panel of chart number seven. These sectors are experiencing frictions created by the pandemic, and some of them, such as transport services, are also sensitive to energy prices. Imported supply shocks increase the uncertainty surrounding the medium-term inflation outlook in two main ways. First, energy-driven inflation acts as a tax on consumption and a break on production. This adds to the uncertainty around the growth outlook, making it harder to judge when the economy is likely to reach full capacity. We are still some way short of returning to our pre-crisis GDP trend, as is visible from chart number eight. Higher energy prices could further delay the return to that growth path. The heavier energy bill has already reduced household purchasing power by around 2% and is negatively affecting consumer confidence, as you can see from chart number nine. It is also eroding financial buffers, especially for households with low incomes, reducing the degree to which this saving can support consumption in the future, as is visible from chart number 10. Second, prolonged imported price shocks make it harder to assess whether inflation is feeding into domestic price pressures. The fact that core inflation is increasing above 2% may initially seem to suggest that domestic inflationary pressures are accumulating. However, rising core inflation is partly due to higher energy prices, which are pushing up costs in almost all sectors, as is visible from chart number 11. Similarly, industrial goods inflation may remain elevated in the near term due to higher input costs, but inventory levels are starting to return to normal. And precautionary stocks that initially prolong tensions may ultimately lead to excess inventories once bottlenecks ease. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is now intensifying uncertainty. We face greater financial volatility in the short term as investors anticipate the potential impact of sanctions and possible retaliatory actions. And these dislocations might be felt unevenly threatening the smooth transmission of our monetary policy across the euro area. But we also face greater macroeconomic uncertainty in the medium term. The higher energy prices triggered by the conflict in Ukraine point to a longer period of above target inflation. At the same time, they increase the terms of trade tax and depress economic confidence, aggravating downside risks to growth and inflation. This means the path to price stability is exposed to pitfalls on both sides. As imported inflation now looks set to last longer, we will need to see wages catch up sufficiently to avoid a further fall in purchasing power. If that does not happen, we might face a slower closure of the output gap and renewed disinflationary pressures once bad inflation subsides. However, we could also be confronted with an opposite scenario where high inflation proves to be so persistent that it destabilizes inflation expectations. That could feed into wage negotiations and domestic price pressures, entrenching inflation above our target. Whether the economy can avoid these risks depends crucially on our policy response. If we respond to a false signal and react to a rise in inflation that might not be lasting, we could suffocate the recovery. But if we are too timid in the face of signs that inflation is becoming a domestic process, we might give the impression that we lack determination to secure price stability. In both scenarios, we should not infer the medium-term inflation outlook from present inflation figures. We need to carefully assess the prospects for wage growth, productivity growth, and inflation expectations. So far, the labor, the labor market is not looking excessively tight, especially in comparison with other jurisdictions. And even a significant increase in wage growth would not put it much above trend productivity growth plus core, uh, our inflation target, as you see from chart number 12. 
Wage growth has remained moderate to date, and the shock from the Ukraine conflict could prompt further caution. Different measures of inflation expectations also show no signs of the anchoring on the upside, as you can see on charts 13 and 14. Therefore, the danger of high inflation becoming entrenched seems contained at the moment. At the same time, I would like to see more evidence that improvements in labor markets are translating into wage growth consistent with our 2% target to be confident that the low inflation scenario has fully disappeared. Indeed, a key conclusion of, of our strategy review was that when coming out of a, period, uh, a long period of low inflation, we should wait to see underlying inflation sufficiently advanced before adjusting policy of which wages are a central component. In the current situation, the task for the ECB is therefore twofold. First, with the crisis in Ukraine, our immediate priority is to protect the functioning of the financial sector and bolster confidence in order to contain the impact of the shock on the economy and keep in place the conditions for the smooth implementation of monetary policy. Second, we should aim to accompany the recovery with a light touch, taking moderate and careful steps as the fallout from the crisis becomes clearer. More than 40 years ago, William Brainerd proposed the conservatism principle, which calls for cautious action when policymakers are faced with uncertainty. This principle doesn't apply to all forms of uncertainty. For example, when faced with deflationary shocks that risk rooting interest rates at the lower bound, it pays to act more decisively. The same is true when inflation expectations are at risk of becoming de-anchored. And if measures to avoid market dislocations prove necessary in response to the war in Ukraine, we should intervene with equal determination using all our instruments. In this respect, we reiterated in our February decision that within the Governing Council's mandate, under stressed conditions, flexibility will remain an element of monetary policy whenever threats to monetary policy transmission jeopardize the attainment of price stability. But when policymakers are uncertain about the effects of their own policy on the economy, it is advisable to take small steps. And this is the case for the path out of the pandemic. Confronted with supply shocks that are both inflationary and contractionary, we should adjust our policy moderately and progressively as we receive feedback on the effects of our actions. We began reducing the pace of net asset purchases last year, and we are on track to return to our pre-pandemic policy setting by September this year, as shown on the left panel of Charles 15. Longer-term real yields have already returned to their pre-pandemic levels, as you can see from the right panel of Charles 15. The inflation outlook is stronger today than it was before the pandemic. Therefore, once the current crisis has abated, ensuring that monetary policy accompanies the recovery with a light touch may be consistent with a further adjustment in our net asset purchases. Beyond that, additional modifications to our stance should be considered very carefully for three main reasons. First, in recent months, real yields have already risen more than in the United States, as is visible from the right panel of chart 15, in spite of the different positions in the cycle. It would be imprudent to move further until we have strong confirmation that both actual and expected inflation is durably re-anchoring at 2% in a world of tighter financing conditions. This is especially important given that the equilibrium real interest rate is subject to large uncertainty as shown on chart 16, making it difficult to judge how far we are from a neutral policy stance. Second, we need to be certain that removing accommodation too suddenly will not trigger market turmoil, as this could lead to financial markets overreacting and financing conditions to tighten abruptly. 
This would set back the recovery in underlying inflation and the re-anchoring of inflation expectations at our target. We have already seen that in the current environment, inflation expectations are highly sensitive to abrupt changes in the expected path of policy. Before the escalation of tensions in Ukraine, uh, markets had brought forward their expectations of rate liftoff. This was associated to, with a reversal in the improvement of market-based inflation expectations, as is apparent on the left panel of chart 17. The fact that this decrease in inflation expectations was unique to the euro area might have revealed concerns that the ECB would overreact to current inflation numbers. These concerns are, were also hinted at by the shape of the e, uh, STR forward curve, which peaked in 2024 and then inverted somewhat, as you can see on the right panel of chart 17. The end of net asset purchases in the euro area in 2018 was smooth, mainly because short-term rates remained anchored by our forward guidance. We had not been in a situation, we have not been in a situation before where markets are simultaneously reappraising the path of asset purchases and the path of rates. Moreover, markets are reappraising the tightening intention of all major central banks at the same time, increasing the risk of undesirable spillovers on euro area financing conditions. Third, a key lesson from the previous crisis is not only that rates should not be raised prematurely, but also that doing so without the right framework in place can lead to renewed financial fragmentation. And this fragmentation could force monetary policy into a trade-off. We could face a choice between triggering an excessive tightening of financial conditions in some parts of the euro area, which would result in domestic demand that is too low, or adjusting the stance by less than would be optimal. Today, fragmentation could result from the legacy effects of the pandemic. So we need a different mechanism for addressing it than during the financial crisis. And we know from experience that the more credible backstop, the more credible a backstop is, the less likely it is to be used. Let me conclude. Whenever we are uncertain about the consequences of our actions, it makes sense to act prudently. Faced with high uncertainty surrounding the medium-term out inflation outlook, we should adjust policy carefully as we see the effects of our decisions so as to avoid suffocating the recovery and cement progress towards price stability. That was already the case before the invasion of Ukraine, but this terrible event has made the need for prudence even greater. The world has become darker and our steps should be smaller still. At the ECB, we stand by the people of Ukraine, who are now seeing what they hold dearest, threatened by an unjustifiable act of aggression that violates the most fundamental principles of international law. That a country can be subjected to a full military invasion should steal our determination to defend those principles whenever, wherever we are, however we can. The ECB's role is clear. We will take any measures necessary using all our instruments to shore up confidence and stabilize financial markets. This is the duty of a central bank in times of emergency. And we will swiftly implement the sanctions decided by the European Union. The scenes we have witnessed this past week will scar our memories forever. But I hope that one day we will look back on this moment and will be proud that we did our duty showed resolve and unity and sought to uphold the universal values of peace, freedom, and prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio, for this very exhaustive analysis, or in particular the pre of the pre, of course, the conflict situation and the policy implication that we can draw from it. I see that people have already started asking questions. I encourage you, you all again to pose your question in the Q&A, possibly not too long in terms of text so that it's easier to read. But before opening the floor, let me give now the, the floor to Jean for his comments. Please, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And, and thank you, uh, Fabio, for, for this, uh, this speech. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's important in this type of situation 
to be very clear, very detailed, very precise, and you have provided not only a clear analysis and, uh, and views about the policy going forward, but also uh, a very detailed um, description of the, the analytical uh, basis for, for your view and your, your prescription. So let me discuss by uh, so dividing my comment in three. First, uh, on your uh, assessment, uh, what I would sort of call the mid-February assessment before the situation deteriorated. Second, on uh, the policy implications of this assessment. And third, on the new context and, and what it implies, something on which obviously you, you, you have been more uh, you know, shorter and uh, more, more, more concise, but I, I think this is something we, we should discuss. So on the on the assessment, let me let me uh, base myself on on your distinction between the three types of inflation: the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think the message you gave us is that we still don't have enough of the good inflation, meaning the inflation that comes from the, the inflation on target that comes from the the macroeconomic balance between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Uh, you, you sort of uh, showed, you know, why demand is still below uh, trend, why wages are not uh, rising significantly, why, why savings are still being built up. Um, so that's uh, clear on the good inflation. On the bad inflation, we, we're having it, but uh, you uh, gave us reasonable prospect to, to think that it, it should abate. And, and third, on the ugly inflation, meaning the inflation that affects expectations and that becomes uh, entrenched, uh, you, you're saying that um, uh, there is no uh, <clears throat> re-anchoring of uh, expectation. In a way, we're seeing the de disappearance of the ugly deflation, but we're not seeing the emergence of the ugly inflation. So I would basically concur with this assessment. Um, I have one question I want to, to ask, which is on your very benign view on potential output. Basically, when you said, you know, we're still not uh, back on, on track uh, with respect to the, uh, the pre-crisis uh, uh, outlook for, for, uh, for growth. Um, and, um, here there are there are questions there are questions because of the investment shortfall there are questions because of the productivity consequences of this crisis we are highly uncertain about that i tend to share the view that there are positive elements uh, like the uh, fact that companies have had to experiment with new ways of organizing themselves that they have digitized in response to the pandemic crisis, and that this would show up in, in, in productivity down the road. But also, there has been, uh, you know, there's still people stuck, workers stuck uh, in a situation where they half underutilized, idle, there are sectoral problems, there is a lack of reallocation, at least in Europe compared to the US. So the question is what justifies your, your optimism in, in this respect? Let me move to the second uh, question, which is the, the, the policy implication. Here, the message you gave um, is that very clearly you said we, the ECB has to remain cautious, it has to remain data driven. Uh, we, don't, we, we shouldn't anticipate what's going to, to happen when we don't know, we don't have sufficient information, and we should adapt. Now, uh, your overall assessment is that the risks, and here I'm speaking, uh, you know, uh, with reference to the assessment made before uh, the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, um, that the risks were still tilted on the on the downside. I mean, you you have a, a sentence which is which is pretty clear in the speech in this regard uh, when you say that we find it the danger of high inflation becoming entrenched seems contained at the moment. At the same time, I would like to see more evidence that improvement in labor markets are translating into wage growth consistent with our 2% target to be confident that the low inflation scenario has fully disappeared. So basically what you're saying that they are, the, the, the risks are not fully symmetric 
that there is a more of a, of a risk on the, on the downside. Um, you were saying also that uh, real, real, real yields are already on the rise uh, and that there is a need to avoid excessive tightening <coughs> uh, with respect to, to market conditions. So basically what my question would be exactly what does it mean? Because you've been a bit elusive on the policy consequences. So you're saying the, the, the case for reducing, continuing to reduce the net asset purchases uh, in the context of the PEP, that's clear. There is a, a need to be cautious with the policy rate and avoid premature increases. And if, if and, and when there is action on the policy rate, uh, the ECB should stand ready to use <clears throat> the asset purchase as a, as a backstop. So you're referring to a framework uh, in order to avoid uh, disruption, fragmentation risk that could come from this uh, policy action. So does it mean that essentially, if I refer to the, the strategy, to the strategy framework that was um, released in, in August of uh, <clears throat> of last year, that um, there, there are three conditions for increasing rates, uh, you know, uh, and, and two of them. So inflation being on target durably for the rest of the projection horizon. And uh, the, the other one, which is that progress uh, in underlying inflation is sufficiently advanced to be consistent with inflation stabilizing at 2% over the medium term. Do you mean that those two conditions are not really met at, at present. Um, and it, it seems to me that you're also meaning that there should no, be no departure from the agreed sequencing uh, as regards the, the, the policy move, the sequencing of uh, uh, you know, ending net asset purchases, uh, uh, the uh, uh, rise in rates and uh, the uh, tapering of, uh, of the asset uh, 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 portfolio. Um, I think what you're saying is that this is the right sequencing and there should be no departure from, from it. So let me move to my third uh, set of questions, which is on the, on the new context. Here, I think we can, we can share the view that um, we're facing uh, a shock we need to characterize. So there is certainly an adverse confidence shock. There is certainly a potentially at least a seriously adverse supply shock with further uh, inflationary consequences, but also the erosion of purchasing power and the real balances of the, the household sector. Um, there are uh, significant fiscal costs down the road, directly and indirectly. There is a, a risk that risk premia across the board will increase because of this environment with consequences for, for sovereign bond markets. Um, we're facing, and we don't know exactly how it will play out, but we are in a sort of game of chicken on, on gas with uh, you know, uh, Europe, the EU depending on, on uh, Russian gas supplies and, and Russia depending on the the revenue it can grow from uh, gas exports. And I think the last thing I would say is that we, we certainly have to equip our, ourselves for, for lasting confrontation. We don't know how long it will, it will last, but certainly we should be ready for it to, to, to last uh, long. So you've been uh, clear on the ECB response. I think there are a number of issues also that matter um, with respect to the environment in which the ECB will operate. One is the strength of the fiscal response and the nature of the fiscal response uh, that is going to be, to be brought by uh, member states. Are, are they uh, going to help protect households from the price rises? Um, uh, so is it going to be a, a way to, to, to have a fiscal response to, the, to this shock that would in a way relieve monetary policy from having to respond uh, in, in full force? The second uh, issue is obviously the degree of fiscal solidarity in the EU because it's a very asymmetric shock. And for one, it's a shock that will affect uh, Northern Europe very strongly, especially Germany uh, with the gas supplies. So, so the question of the degree of, of, of solidarity in the EU, I think it, it is also important not only 
for political reasons or, or for strategic reasons, but also in a way for economic reasons. So let me stop here uh, with these three uh, type of questions corresponding to uh, your speech, but also to you know the question we have to ask ourselves in, in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. I think this is a very exhaustive and, and really interesting discussion. Fabio, maybe I give the floor back to you, but let me add, for example, some questions that already came from the floor. One, for example, related to the sequencing of exit that also Jean was referring to, whether uh, you were delineating a certain sequence uh, pre-conflict or mid-February, let's call it mid-February, as Jean said, and whether these new events may change the sequence that you would have in mind. Please. Okay, let, let me address the monetary policy uh, questions first, and then I come to the broader issues raised by Jean that are only partly related to uh, monetary policy, but they refer to the sequence of uh, adverse shocks that uh, hit the European economy, starting with the pandemic and now with the war in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, on um, on how uh, I see risks, do I see risks on uh, um, more on the downside than on the upside? Now, the message that I have tried to to give is that risks are now on both sides. Uh, the uncertainty of inflation is very high. We see forces that could push uh, inflation down or up. Um, we could well end in a, in a situation in which inflation is uh, uh, higher than 2% for a very long period, and this spills over to wages and inflation expectations. But uh, first of all, uh, we have um, a previous history of monetary policy decisions. And... Uh, if you look at the uh, the perception by markets, by investors of the monetary policy of the ECB, which led us to uh, do our monetary policy strategy review, it's a, a history uh, that uh, uh, denotes very clearly a perception that we might be might feel comfortable with in, uh, inflation rates below two percent. Not only that, but also uh, uh, if. Uh, uh, inflation, uh, we find out that inflation is drifting uh, above 2%, we can hike. But the asymmetry is, uh, is implied by, by the presence of the lower bound. And uh, we can, up to a point, stimulate the economy if we found out ex post that uh, you know, what we considered an inflationary shock, which could lead to a persistently high inflation, was in fact a one-off effect of a supply shock of oil, as it happened in the past, and then uh, I think that the risk would be at that point uh, uh, very high. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, should also take into account the credibility of the ECB. Why are wages not increasing? Why are expectations after a year and a half of uh, uh, above target uh, inflation? Well, because people know, investors know, markets understand that the ECB will not will not tolerate inflation above 2%, will not tolerate a, a divergence from our price stability target, which is 2%. So there's no doubt about that. And this is giving us the luxury of taking time to um, assess carefully the nature of the shock, its potential implications, without running excessive risks that um, an untimely uh, tightening of financing conditions could derail the recovery and bring us back to the previous world in which uh, inflation was uh, stubbornly below 2%, with all the consequences that uh, we have observed in the last 10 years. In the, in the speech, I, I mentioned a recent work by Ricardo Reis, in which he looks at the, the nature of take risks surrounding inflation, the inflation outlook in the euro area and in the US. And he finds that even now, after uh, a prolonged period of above uh, target inflation, markets in the euro area are concerned about the euro area getting back into a too low inflation, actually a deflationary environment. They do not have doubts that the ECB could let inflation uh, stabilize above 2%. There is no indication uh, in the evidence that uh, Ricardo presents 
And the opposite happens in the US. In the US, the risk of deflation is uh, virtually zero. I'm talking about tail risks here. The, the risk of deflation is virtually uh, non-existent, while uh, the risk of inflation has a high probability. So we have to cope with a situation which, if we are on the upside, we can correct it. And we are not seeing signs that this is the case. If we are on the downside, then we have a problem because uh, 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 stimulating the economy uh, would be problematic in particular because of the, of the, of the lower bound. Um, on the sequencing, well, uh, there is a lot of discussion on the sequencing that I, I must confess I uh, failed to understand. Uh, we have started to use uh, asset purchases uh, which we call unconventional policy measures because they are unconventional. They come after the convention in, in, my, in my sequence. We started to, to use uh, purchases when we have uh, taken uh, uh, interest rates in the vicinity of the lower bound. And we wanted to stimulate the economy further. And then we were forced to start purchases. Um, it would be in my view, schizophrenic, I, I can, can already hear the criticism that we would uh, get if at the same time we um, uh, uh, hiked and we continued to buy uh, assets. That is to increase interest rates with our uh, conventional measures and decrease interest rates with our unconventional measures it would be schizophrenic, okay? When we consider that uh, 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 we should adjust policy in view of increasing inflationary risks, we will first of all stop pushing down interest rates and then start pushing them up. Uh, uh, this discussion on, uh, on the sequence uh, started and, and I, I um, associate it to the, the analysis of, uh, of um, uh, Charles Gouda, but many others have raised this point because the concern emerged, especially in the US, who are in a different cyclical position, that uh, the, the phase out from uh, asset purchases could require too much time. And so the, the, the Fed would be behind the curve when started tightening. But uh, that was a concern when asset purchases were very substantial. The ECB will get in, uh, in uh, Q2, or yes, don't remember precisely, Q3 maybe at 20 billion per month. We were at above 100 last year, so the phase out from 20 billion can be done overnight, very easily. So there is no constraint in our framework. We can stop purchases from this very low monthly uh, 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 volume uh, almost immediately, and we can start hiking whenever it would be uh, ideal to do so. So uh, it would be inconsistent to, at the same time, decrease and increase interest rates. And we do not, I don't see the, the constraint in terms of timing of our uh, uh, tightening, uh, should it become necessary uh, from the, the, the phase out, the period which is necessary to phase out without inducing instability in the markets uh, from, uh, to exit from our asset purchases. We can do it very easily, very quickly. On uh, why am I uh, um, optimistic? Uh, I'm not optimistic. Uh, as I said before, I'm trying to, to um, place risks on, on both sides. On, on the structural evolution of the, of the economy, why am I uh, more positive? Well, because the reaction of uh, the um, uh, authorities at large uh, uh, in the pandemic uh, crisis has been pretty different from the reaction we saw during the financial crisis. Uh, we didn't see austerity in the midst of a recession. We didn't see hikes during a, a, a supply shock and uh, after a sovereign crisis before a recession. We didn't see that. We have seen a coordinated intervention by fiscal and monetary authorities. And this is the assuring why. Well, because, uh, you know, and I link this, Jean, to your question on, uh, on the consequences of the war. What we have seen during the financial crisis is that uh, demand has moved from one sector to the other. And this has caused uh, bottlenecks and has pushed up inflation. Uh, now, if we started, and uh, I mean, we could start um, uh, intervening uh, to uh, contain, to suffocate that inflation, um, given that the, 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 the motivations behind that uh, in, uh, mismatch between demand and supply is not excess demand, it's uh, 
a problem that starts from supply, from badness, from reallocation. Uh, I think that the right way to go would not be to, uh, we cannot ignore it, of course. If inflation starts uh, going uh, above 2%, we have to intervene. But the right recipe, the right uh, policy mix would be one in which uh, fiscal policy intervenes to reallocate resources, to stimulate growth in those sectors that are seeing an increase in demand uh, so that we do not see those bottlenecks, we do not see those uh, um, pressures on uh, inflation, and we do not force monetary policy to intervene to suffocate demand, which is already subdued in some sectors, without much hope to uh, contain uh, inflation uh, coming from other sectors for reasons that are uh, hardly affected by monetary policy. So uh, we should have uh, uh, fiscal policies that... Uh, uh, allocate resources for uh, digital transition, for uh, technology. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm uh, convinced that we will see uh, an increase in military spending. We will see a number of, of measures by governments that uh, will, uh, uh, and I hope, will continue to intervene to manage supply rather than uh, hope of uh, containing inflation by compressing demand, which is still below potential and uh, which is uh, uh, you know, um, pushed up in those sectors in which it is uh, uh, increasing rapidly for different reasons than uh, taste, than uh, uh, exuberance. It's uh, bottlenecks, it's a mismatch between demand and supply. So I hope that uh, this uh, positive attitude, this positive interaction between monetary and fiscal policy will continue in the future. We will avoid unnecessary tightening of the, uh, uh, by, by monetary policy. But of course, if we will have to do it, we will do it. OK, so let me come to another point that has been raised in the discussion, uh, sorry, in the, in the chat, which refers to fragmentation. So let me put it from different perspectives. First, Julian Carlo says, taking from your speech, you said that the fragmentation could result from the legacy effect of the pandemic. And then you also went on saying that the more credible a backstop is, the less likely it is that one has to use it. So starting from this presumption, uh, Julian asked, that sounds to me like Dr. Panetta is indicating that he'd like to see the ECB develop a new policy instrument aimed at stemming fragmentation, asymmetric monetary policy transition, drawing on the successful experience, particularly regarding flexibility, which is a key feature of PEP. Would, you, would he like to expand on this idea? Could it be like a spread yield control? But how to identify the correct parameters to implement that, assuming this is what you have in mind? I, in my, in my uh, presentation today, uh, I flag uh, the objective of policy, and in my speech, I'm uh, more explicit about that. How to implement that in practice, I don't think should I should discuss, because there would be a decision by the Governing Council, uh, a decision which uh, uh, I, you know, we will uh, certainly discuss, and would be totally irrespectful for me if I started giving now uh, solutions. I'm flagging the problems today. I'm... Um, uh, uh, presenting the case for a different approach to the same problem we have seen in during the financial crisis. The difference is, and this triggers my comments on a different approach, that during the financial crisis, moral hazard was clearly a factor, clearly an issue. There were governments that had uh, um, undisciplined fiscal policies that did not adjust, that were hit by the crisis, which was uh, largely generated by uh, their own weaknesses. Here, I see a different situation. I see a totally exogenous shock that is hitting some of the member states, and this has the potential to create uh, tensions, create frictions in the implementation of monetary policy. And we have seen this during the pandemic. Uh, this economic analysis leads me to, to propose that we have a open discussion on how our monetary policy should avoid being cornered in a situation in which we have the two options that I have described in my presentation, which I will not repeat, and which I discuss even more in detail in, uh, in, my, in my speech, in the written text, which, by the way, it's redundant, is published on the website of the ECB. 
then I think we should have uh, given also the different attitude of governments. I think we should have um, a discussion on this issue. And um, uh, clearly, uh, the ECB cannot uh, uh, intervene um, without a framework. And we do have a framework which has been established by the European Union. It's the NGEU framework. And we should build on that to give a solution to a problem that has not disappeared after 10 years. OK. Uh one other comment, uh, starting from your speech, that is a little bit related to this, although maybe not fully, is from Eric van der Koji when he says, I miss in the analysis comments about the level of inflation in relation to the still high level of debt to GDP ratio. Would you like to comment on this? I'm not sure I understand the question. The relationship between uh, debt to GDP ratios and inflation, looking at the Japanese experience is at best unclear to me. Uh, maybe there is more in the question that I fail to understand. But uh, in, in any case, let me uh, on this very clear, we are not um, doing our monetary policy looking at debt to GDP ratios. We look at debt to GDP ratios uh, to the extent that they can uh, uh, create tensions they create frictions to the implementation of our monetary policy. The debt to GDP ratio sustainability are issues for governments. They become an issue for the ECB if they affect our monetary policy. And this is the gist of my argument today on fragmentation. We should take into account fragmentation because fragmentation, again, let me be very clear, as we have seen in the past on repeated occasions, can affect, adversely affect our monetary policy. But uh, certainly we will not uh, calibrate our monetary policy on the basis or looking at the debt to GDP ratios. Thank you, Fabio. Let, let me ask another question then. Maybe let me ask it to Jean. Maybe he's also more free to answer this. Given also your comments you said before on fiscal policy and the fact that this shock could be asymmetric in terms of consequences, uh, hitting Germany maybe more than other countries. So one question was whether you think economic sanction to third countries could also lead to more fragmentation in Europe. Yes, they could, because uh, I, I do not have uh, visibility. I think nobody has visibility on future developments, but uh, uh, we now see the sanctions. We might see um, uh, retaliation. And if retaliation extends to um, commodities, then uh, the dependency of different countries on uh, uh, energy uh, imports on uh, certain commodities differs. And uh, of course, uh, the, the consequences uh, of the uh, interaction we have started, unfortunately, could be uh, quite different across different countries. But Jeanne, if I can come to you now, when you said before, it can be asymmetric in short, I mean, to some extent, one can say this is still a complete exogenous shock. And then the exposure of the countries is asymmetric, it depends on their past history. I mean, one could have made the same argument of the pandemic, depending on the places in intensive care that the various countries had. So to which extent this is really different from an exogenous shock in your view? Well, it, it is really an exogenous shock. I mean, the, 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 the... Some countries are, are hit twice. I mean, Italy being being obviously one because Italy was uh, both hit by the pandemic very strongly and very early, uh, and then it, it's hit because of its dependency on Russian gas. But this time with with Germany, which has an even higher dependency, whereas a country like Spain doesn't depend on Russian gas at all. So, so the question is really what sort of uh, solidarity and what sort of framework to use your, your term. Uh, should we have to, to, to cope with this type of situation. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, when you're referring to a framework, you're referring at the same time to the fiscal response, the NGU, and whatever can come out of this crisis or to, to tackle this crisis, and the monetary policy response, the PEP and the flexibility <clears throat> that remains. So, is it really you're thinking that the two should go hand in hand and that the, the, the response to this new type of asymmetric shock should basically build on this successful response to the pandemic? Uh, it depends on the, on, on the shock, of course. 
If the shock is a demand shock, we are perfectly equipped to deal with it. If the shock is a severe supply shock, then uh, we, have seen, we have seen the limits of monetary policy and the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy is a virtuous choice by policymakers. We have seen it in all countries. The, the, the uh, response uh, has been uh, much wiser this time, faced with a supply, a genuinely supply shock uh, in all major jurisdictions. And let me just one, uh, one comment on what you said, uh, which I totally agree. It's not about solidarity. A common response is not only about solidarity. Of course, solidarity is always welcome within a, a jurisdiction that is progressing towards unity, towards becoming a full-fledged single country sometimes in the future. It is about mutual convenience. Uh, take climate. Suppose that some countries have some form of, of financial constraints because uh, of different degree of uh, development, financial deepening, or because simply their debt to GDP ratios are too high. Will it make sense that one country starts uh, uh, a very decisive uh, uh, um, uh, progress towards decarbonization while the others are not? Or uh, if uh, we repeat the experience of the last decade in which uh, there was an idea by some that uh, you know, at least some jurisdictions could rely mostly on uh, external demand, which proved to be uh, not correct. Now, we are too large to rely on uh, foreign demand only. We are the second uh, largest economic jurisdiction in the world. We, cannot, we are not a small open economy that could rely on foreign demand. We have to build our own demand. And this comes with mutual convenience to develop demand, to progress towards uh, structural reforms, towards uh, you know, a, a system that would diversify shocks and uh, have mutual support that could keep internal demand high enough to stimulate the economy and not uh, to lose production capacity every time we are hit by a shock. Then we should avoid. It's solidarity, which is always work and a beautiful thing, and also it's economic convenience. May I, may I follow up on what you uh, sure, yeah. just said on the, on the policy mix, just to be clear. Um, there is, there will be more of the bad inflation. I mean, there is already more of the bad inflation. So the question is how much of this additional bad inflation can you tolerate until you have to, to react? And therefore, how much of this bad inflation should be actually tackled by fiscal policy? This, this is a type of, of question that always arise in, in this type of situation where you know, a, a conflict creates shortages and the, the standard allocation of tasks between monetary and fiscal policy is, is questioned. My uh, view is that we should address inflationary problems that we can address, that we have some hope to address. If we see inflation being driven by an increase in oil prices, no increase in wages, no de-anchoring of inflation expectations, we may tighten, but we will not increase oil supply, which would be the only thing we need uh, to uh, contain inflation pressures. Or if we see a, a dislocation of demand among sectors, we can hardly influence that. Monetary policy cannot intervene on individual sectors. This can be done by fiscal policy. Suppose that this is not going to be the case. I hope it will not. There is a permanent decrease in the demand for, uh, for holidays after the, the, the uh, pandemic. And people would start staying at home watching movies. Maybe we should. Uh, I hope this will never happen. Eh? I like going on holidays. But uh, we should have policies that address this change in demand. Here, uh, the change in demand is not driven by taste. It's not driven by choice by consumers. It is driven by a sequence of shock and, as of late, by a war, which might have lasting consequences across sectors. Their fiscal policies should intervene and to shift from demand and policies should shift from demand management only to supply management uh, as well. This is, in my view, the answer, because if you continue to suffocate demand and the tensions, uh, the inflationary tensions come from other sources, uh, would not be very useful. We would have lower demand, but the same inflation. So uh, that's why in my speech, I insist a lot 
in uh, uh, analyzing as carefully as possible the um, propagation mechanisms can, can turn these supply shocks into domestic inflation, which could propagate across the economy and become entrenched. That is the role for monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you very much. I think we have exhausted our time. Is 1.30, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm sure you have lots of things to do on your desk, so I don't want to keep you here more. I wish we had more time. I wish we could have hold this seminar in a different context, but thank you to both of you for being here, to the audience, and to the interesting discussion, and let's hope that things will improve after, I mean, from now on. Let's hope that the negotiations and things will lead to a better outcome. Yeah, well, Thank we you, have Elena. Here. Thank you, Jean. Thank you to all those who have followed this seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.